on the air tonight with a hot mess at airports everywhere with Southwest apologizing for how bad things are getting. So many travelers stranded that the federal government is now getting involved. The transportation secretary just now sitting down with us. We're live with what it's like on the ground, in the sky, and when things may start to get better. Plus, some breaking news just in the last hour. The Supreme Court will let a controversial border policy stay in place. We'll talk about what that means for tens of thousands of migrants looking for asylum now. And a new study out today shows more and more kids being taken to the ER for mental health care. The desperation driving that spike and what parents can do. Plus, in tonight's original, we're looking at how South Korea is way behind other developed countries when it comes to LGBTQ plus rights, how some activists there are working hard to change it. And half a billion dollars could be yours, maybe, in tonight's Mega Millions drawing, the second biggest jackpot of the year. And if you feel like there's been a lot of big lottos lately, you are not wrong. We're going to explain why a little bit later on in the show. Hey there, I'm Hallie. It's good to be with you. And just when you thought the mess at airports could not get messier, welcome to Tuesday. Especially if you're flying one airline in particular. Right now, as we speak, you've got more than 3,000 flights canceled, another 5,000 plus delayed. Why? Most of the big airlines have recovered after that massive winter storm over the holiday weekend. Except for one, Southwest, where problems seem to have really snowballed over the last couple of days. More than 60% of Southwest flights have been spiked today. For comparison, some other big airlines like American and United, they've only canceled a max of about 2% of flights today. Southwest is saying sorry, but that is 0% helpful to people trying to manage their end of 2022 plans, especially considering Southwest is only flying about a third of its usual schedule today. Seems like these days, anytime you book an airline, you roll the dice. They canceled the flight, and our bags and luggage were stuck in Chicago for two days. What are your hopes as you guys board this flight? That it takes off. It's not just travelers who are upset. Members of Congress want the company to pay customers for the inconvenience. And now you've got the federal government maybe getting involved, with the Department of Transportation calling the whole thing unacceptable. Nayala Charles is covering this live for us from LAX. Nayala, I mean, this has gotten the attention of President Biden, who is tweeting about this tonight. The question is, what are the feds going to actually do about it? And will it make a difference to all these people who are trying to figure out how to get home? Right here in LAX, it's horrible listening to everyone's stories about how they wanted to leave but can't get out of here, even if it is Los Angeles. Take a look here at the board. You can see a uh, majority of these flights departing are canceled, and Southwest says it's actually uh, making all flights out of all the Southern California airports unavailable until New Year's Eve. In a statement to us, they say, we're working with safety at the forefront to urgently address wide-scale disruption by rebalancing Balancing the airline and repositioning crews in our fleet ultimately to best serve all who plan to travel with us. And like you said, Holly, the reason why Southwest is getting so much attention is because comparatively speaking to the other airlines, it has more delays and cancellations. According to FlightAware today, 63% of all canceled flights are Southwest flights. And that's why it's getting the attention of the Department of Transportation, because they're calling that the fiasco here unacceptable, not just on the delays and cancellation side, but also what they're calling a customer support failure. Hallie? One of the things that's been interesting as we've seen this develop throughout the course of the day has been the federal response to this. Our Tom Yamas just spoke with Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg, like literally just in the last 20 minutes or so. I want to play a piece of this conversation here. Uh, let, let me roll it. Secretary, I want to go back to October of last year when Southwest had nearly the exact same problem. Thousands of flights canceled. How can travelers have faith in the airline and, to be frank, have faith in your department as a watchdog if these problems keep happening? Well, what we did, especially over the course of the problems we saw this year, was press the airlines to increase their customer service commitments. They did that. They did that in writing. And now that we have that in hand, we are able to hold them accountable to a higher standard than what was possible last year. Now, again, what we have going on right now is different for Southwest, this one airline, than what we're seeing across the rest of the system. As a watchdog, we are going to hold them accountable for meeting those customer service commitments. And we're 
going to have to take a deeper look at what's going on with their scheduling systems, other issues that uh, may have contributed to this. Because while we all understand that uh, you can't control the weather, uh, this, is, this has clearly crossed the line from what's an uncontrollable weather situation to something that is the airline's direct responsibility. More from that interview with the Transportation Secretary tonight on Nightly News starting at 6.30 Eastern. Al, it was interesting to hear the Secretary say that Southwest, in his view, has clearly crossed a line, that this situation is different from the kind of run-of-the-mill issues that might be caused. Like, yeah, when there's weather, this stuff happens, but this is not that. Right, and it's possible, Hallie, that if they find that Southwest is liable for the issues we're seeing here, that they get fined. Because you remember back in November, the Department of Transportation actually fined six airlines more than $7 million for the delays and uh, cancellations that customers experienced without getting a refund for their summer flights. So although Southwest wasn't one of the six airlines then, it's possible going forward that that's a tool that the Department of Transportation will use going forward. Hallie? Nyla Charles live for us there at LAX in front of that Southwest counter. Just look back there, Nyla. How is it? Is it been like it doesn't look so bad now. What's it been like throughout the day? I mean, a total show. Well, Hallie, the reason why it doesn't look so bad is because the majority of people who purchase the Southwest flight know that it doesn't matter because they're not getting out of here. If you look here, the reason why you do see people... Right. So the people that you do see here are here because they say they, some of them have been stranded in Los Angeles for days and say they're only a way they can get a customer service person to talk to them is by coming here directly to the airport oh, where they can speak to the Southwest customer service representatives because they say when they've tried to call Southwest to see if they can get a refund or get on another flight, they're being put on hold for five hours and then it just hangs up so they can't even reach anyone. So if just so you can get an understanding of just how bad it is, I want you to hear well, what we heard from a passenger who was trying to leave today but doesn't know if he will be able to. Take a listen. While we were in Denver, trying to leave Denver, our, our bag sat on the tarmac for three hours. But my insulin was totally frozen. That was in my bag, so that was useless. I'm just tired, frustrated the kids are, you know. It's hard, you know, with nothing, you know, no clothes, nothing. Yeah, so it's, it's difficult, right? Because part of the reason why this has been so difficult for customers and the passengers is because they haven't been notified about cancellations until after they checked in. So they're not having access to anything that they have in their bags. Hallie? Nyala Charles, uh, again, live from us there at LAX. Thanks for that, Nyala. I just was kind of curious at the scene there behind you. I appreciate that. We talked about the winter weather and how that has played at least somewhat of a part in some of those other airline delays. But listen, the winter weather is not over with Buffalo, New York, trying to recover from what has become the deadliest storm in that area in at least two generations. We're learning now today that more than 30 people have been killed because of the storm over these last few days. And to put this in context, right, blizzard conditions. That's like whiteout conditions, crazy wind, tons of snow. 37 straight hours is what they saw in Buffalo. That's the longest blizzard condition situation on record since 1950. Look at this video from a Target employee in one of the suburbs of Buffalo. You had some employees and customers stuck inside the store for more than 50 hours. It was so bad. Look, how were they supposed to get a home, right? Look at those cars. They couldn't, so they stayed inside the Target for something like just about three days. And by the way, today, still snowing. A few more inches with crews working overtime to try to clear what they can and rescues happening, even though in some places driving bans are still in place. It's been lifted mostly everywhere else, though, as Marissa Parra understands. She is live for us there in Buffalo. Talk us through what you're seeing, right? Because in Buffalo itself, people are not supposed to be out on the roads. But at this point, you've got just bare minimum parents who like may need diapers for their kids after being stuck at home for six days you've got people who may right. need to get to the pharmacy to get medication etc what are people supposed to do what are they doing 
Right, and and that's the difficulty here, right? You hear that a giant blizzard and a snowstorm is coming your way. The expectation is you run out and get what you can to hunker down. But we don't know what the situation is for people here on the roads. We do know that there is that travel ban in effect. But just to give you one anecdotal uh, example right Please. here, we just saw someone pull up to one of these houses behind me, and that was actually somebody who drives a snowplow. So it's very possible that a lot of the people you see driving past us on these roads are part of the crews that are trying to deliver not only a emergency services, but maybe perhaps trying to clear the roads behind me. You can probably just make out um, the road behind me here. It is largely passable on some of these larger roads. But as you drive further into these neighborhood streets that you can't see on the other side of the camera, it is still a mess. It is still very hard to get through. So, Hallie, when we talk about why that travel ban is in effect, why they say Please do not drive unless you need to. Remember, there are people who are having emergency events or maybe people who need dialysis. So they have folks with the with the state and, and even on a national level um, helping out with those assistances like dialysis to make sure that those people get the help that they need. So then what's next? Right? What are we hearing from officials there who have been trying to keep in regular contact and giving constant updates here on the situation and how they're trying to help folks recover uh, with the expectation as they're bracing for the potential to find out more people, in fact, have been killed? Right. So I think the this step right now is trying to make sure that anyone who is stuck somewhere has been recovered. And so far, by all accounts, that seems to be the case here in Buffalo. We know that there are people that are in warming shelters. Maybe they had to abandon the cars that they were inside of. But I think in terms of what's next, it's getting those cars that were abandoned off the roads so that they can then clear those roads and then hopefully try to get Buffalo back uh, bustling to where it was where you can drive on these streets before we have this large snow. No melt because Hallie, in terms of what's coming next, we have a warm up in the 40s and 50s expected this weekend. So you're not only going to be having all of that snow melting, it's got to go somewhere, but we're also expecting rain this weekend. So I think flooding will be the next big major concern here. Yeah, it sure is. Marissa Perry, we're glad you're there for us in Buffalo. Keeping an eye on all of it. Appreciate it. So we've talked about the winter weather affecting obviously not just Buffalo, but travel around the country. Some people are like, okay, well, then let me get in my car. Let me drive home after the holidays. Well, guess what? You are hitting peak congestion as we speak. People on the road telling us that they think today is going to be one of the busiest travel days of the year. More than 90% of people who have been out and about over the holiday weekend choosing to drive rather than fly. Here's some folks talking to us about their decision making. My um, sister is stuck in New Orleans. She can't get back home. We're gonna fly next uh, next month in February in January, so I'm nervous about that. But you're right, the delays are crazy. Gary Grumbach is live for us now in Aberdeen, Maryland, at a rest stop that I'm intimately familiar with there on the I-95 corridor. And Gary, I'm sure it's been we talked about it being a hot mess at the airports. I'm sure it's not much better on the roads. Yeah, unless you enjoy uh, being in an airport, a crowded airport with a lot of people that are upset about things outside of their control, drivers definitely won today. But we are, as you mentioned, in the peak congestion mode here. Between 3 and 7 p.m. Uh, Eastern time seems to be the peak congestion. And that's where it's going to be across the country, too. We're seeing that uh, in, in, in metro areas, including D.C., Atlanta, Chicago, and L.A. right now. Uh, but if you could wait until 7 p.m. to head out to where you're going, or better yet, even tomorrow morning, that is going to be the best bet for you. Gary Grumbach live for us there in Aberdeen. Gary, thank you very much. We've got to get to some developing news that is coming into us in just about the last hour or so. The Supreme Court is just announcing that a controversial Trump era border policy called Title 42 is going to stay in place. What is this, right? If you've been listening to the news at all in the past few days, you've probably heard about this. This was put in place under the former president. It was put in place under COVID, right, during the pandemic to try to quickly turn away people seeking asylum at the U.S.-Mexico border, migrants. This was set to expire last week, but Chief Justice John Roberts upheld the policy after a request by Republican attorneys general in 19 states. The court has ruled 5-4 on this one late today with conservative justice Neil Gorsuch siding with the three liberals on the bench. There had been a lot of questions about which way the Supreme Court would go, right? Especially with what is already 
a humanitarian crisis at the border. People looking for asylum, waiting in really cold temperatures. You can see them camping out on streets, some with just a thin blanket or two. Sam Brock knows this. Um, he's seeing it. He's there. He joins us now live from El Paso. And Sam, in just the last minute or two, as we were reading that introduction, we got a new response from the White House on the Supreme Court decision, saying that they will, of course, comply with this order and prepare for the court's review, saying at the same time, they're advancing preparations to manage the border in a humane way when Title 42 eventually lifts. Because the status is right now status quo, right? The, the, the preparation is what comes next. Talk us through it. The status is status quo. So yeah. this essentially kicks the can down the road, Hallie, for at least another five or six months. What happened today is the Supreme Court, with a five to four decision, sided with those 19 Republican states attorneys general who said that the administration, the Biden administration, essentially had not done enough to even defend not removing Title 42 and that they wanted to intervene for fear that you would see a massive surge of migrants coming into cities that are already dealing with it, like El Paso, where I am right now. And so what's going to happen is the Supreme Court will take up the case and it will be decided sometime next year, likely in June. Right. That's where things stand sort of big picture. And it's not surprising to hear the, the White House not coming through with sort of a very emotional response there because they were very clearly lukewarm on this to begin with. Over my shoulder, though, Hallie, look at all these people right now. There's roughly five to six hundred, I'm told here, that are getting fed five to six times a day, or I should say three to four times a day, five to six hundred people. It would be in the thousands, according to the local pastor I just spoke with, if Title 42 were to be lifted. And that is because, Sam, explain that to people, right? That is because more people would be showing up to the border hoping to get into the United States, right? That Versus coming and then being turned away. Explain that for folks so they can understand it. Yeah, there's absolutely no doubt that there's people waiting in Mexico right now to cross the border and come here because they were under the impression that on December 21st, Title 42 was going to be lifted. Now, obviously, that didn't happen, but these folks have spent months trekking over here, Hallie, so it's not a short-term decision by any means. They want to come into the country. Whether or not they're actually going to be able to be received is another matter because, again, this is now going to continue to, I guess, create more tension politically with a lack of congressional action on what's going to happen on the ground level here. But all these folks from Venezuela, from Honduras, from Guatemala, Cuba, Nicaragua, they're all expecting to come here. But this is a key point to make. This, this law, or policy, I should say, Title 42, is being applied inconsistently. People from some countries, like Cuba, can apply for asylum. Those from other countries, like Venezuela, cannot which is why the vast, vast majority of people that you see here right now are from Venezuela, because they couldn't apply for asylum. They can't get into shelters. They don't have the proper documentation. They came across the border anyway, and they're finding themselves and their children sleeping on the streets in 30-degree temperatures. You bring up an important point, Sam, when you talk about the idea that there will be a lack of congressional action. That is what's expected, because one week from today, Republicans will take over the House of Representatives. They have made clear that they want to focus on the border, perhaps impeaching the Homeland Security Secretary, Alejandro Mayorkas. There seems to be very little appetite for any kind of comprehensive immigration reform policy that would address this in a more substantive way, which is why, as you say, the can has been kicked now, likely to June when the Supreme Court drops what will be a highly anticipated decision. Has any of this gotten out? Like, I just wonder, and I know this broke. I'm looking at my watch, like, legit 40 minutes ago. Have, have people started to hear about it? Because this had been a big question mark for the people that you're talking to and that you're with there on the border in Texas. Gosh, that's a great question. People have been asking me all day long really? what is going on with Title 42. Wow. In the last 30 to 45 minutes, I haven't heard any questions from anyone. And so, huh. to be honest, I mean, they certainly, everyone here has, has cell phones. They are checking yeah. information on it, but I have not heard any conversations. And my Spanish is a little suspect. But I have not heard any conversations so far about the Supreme Court uh, decision that came out today. But that's a great point, Hallie, and we'll be going out there right now to find out what people are actually say about this. Just curious, Sam. Uh, thank you so much. I'm so glad you're there. I'm so glad you're bringing us a perspective from there uh, on the ground. We'll look for you more tonight on Nightly News, of course, and then throughout the day on NBC News Now. Appreciate it, friend. Let's talk about what's going down overseas, because today you've got Russia's president banning oil sales to any country that accepts a Western price cap on Russian oil. So this means that any country that agrees to the $60 price cap can no longer buy oil from Russia starting next February. If you're like, wait a second, who, what does this matter, right? It's basically mostly symbolic. A bunch of Western countries, including our country, including the U.S., we already don't buy oil from Russia anymore because they invaded Ukraine and waged war on a sovereign nation. As for what's going on on the ground in Ukraine, serious fighting in a couple of regions there claimed by Russia. 
and a new warning now for people in Ukraine to be on alert for an escalation right on New Year's Eve. The energy minister says there could be an attack that would cause, in his words, maximum damage to the already battered energy grid. Matt Bradley is joining us now. Um, talk about, start there with what, what people are bracing for four or five days from now, three, four days from now. How real is the concern? Well, this is something that President Zelensky has come up with, saying that it's possible that the Russians are going to be attacking ahead of New Year's Eve. But there's been a couple of occasions, several occasions, that we've expected to see a massive Russian bombardment of the entire country or here in Kyiv, and we haven't really seen that. The Russians have already attacked a lot of the electricity infrastructure here in Kyiv. Um, some of it, quite a bit of it, has been brought back online thanks to the tireless work of Ukrainian energy officials and, and workers who have been working 24-7 trying to keep the lights on in this city and really throughout the country. But whether or not Vladimir Putin decides to attack before New Year's Eve in order to try to ruin the holidays once again, well, that's yeah. yet to be seen because, like I said, he's been doing attacks. There's been a constant throb of attacks, mostly on the front lines, mostly in places where there's actual fighting. And for the last several weeks, we haven't seen that kind of large-scale bombardment, even after President Zelensky made that historic trip to Congress and even around Christmas time. Talk about this uh, price cap situation here, because we've been waiting on a response from Russia. We now have it. But as we mentioned, this feels mostly symbolic, Matt, since there aren't many Western countries who are actually getting oil from Russia right now in the first place. Yeah, I mean, Hallie, a lot of that is going to depend on how the Russians decide to implement their decision today, because the fact is the countries that are still buying oil from Russia, like China, Turkey and India, those are countries that are already buying under that $60 price cap, but they're not party to that ban. So if Russia decides anybody who's buying oil under that $60 price cap already, even if they're just buying it because that's the price they're paying, those countries are going to be banned from buying oil. Well, that could have a major impact on global prices. we got to remember, oil is a globally traded commodity. It's a price that's set across the entire world. So it's kind of hard to target it, and that's why this whole thing has been so tricky to begin with. It's why a lot of people say a lot of these bans, these embargoes, these price caps, they're not so effective to begin with because they're trying to split the difference between trying to punish Russia without trying to punish its opponents. Matt Bradley, live for us there in Kyiv. Matt, thank you very much, as always, for your reporting on the ground. Coming up, if you're one of the tens of thousands of people planning your dry January already, new research suggests the benefits last a lot longer than just a month. We'll talk about it. Plus, the January 6th Select Committee releasing even more witness transcripts late today. We'll tell you what we're learning as our team is combing through it all. Coming up. So just in the last little bit here, we got a news dump, as they say in the news business, kind of a gross term, but fitting in this instance, because the January 6th House Select Committee has been dropping these tranches of transcripts, right? Tons and tons of pages and documents of witness interviews from the course of their 18-month-long investigation. We got another one of those drops just within the last couple of hours or so from witnesses to the committee as they investigated the events of January 6th, including the Georgia Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger and several cabinet secretaries, including Steven Mnuchin, for example. I want to bring in Brian Nobles, uh, one of our Capitol Hill correspondents, who has been reading, what, 2,000 pages of material in the last hour or so. So thank you. There's some interesting stuff in here, right? And again, to set the table, this was all about the January 6th committee has put out its final report. We know that they blame Donald Trump for the events of that day. What we're seeing now, though, or how they came to that conclusion based on these interviews, including mm -hmm. from people like Steven Mnuchin, right. Eugene Scalia, who was also a member of the cabinet. And what's interesting to me is there were conversations, not serious apparently, but at least the concept came up of the 25th Amendment. Explain what that is and why that is so bombshell of controversial. Yeah, so the 25th Amendment is something that usually is only reserved to, like, the West Wing. <laughs> Things that... It, the TV shows, yeah, right, exactly. right. It would never actually happen, but it's this mechanism in the Constitution that would give a, a, a majority of cabinet members and the vice president the ability to remove a sitting president from office. And it's really designed for a situation where a president's incapacitated. Like dementia or yes, something, right? or right. he had some sort of serious yes. health issue and is on, a, you know, a respirator or something. So uh, there were conversations. Steve Mnuchin said in his 
conversations uh, transcript that there were conversations, but they never went anywhere. Eugene Scalia, on the other hand, said that he never had a conversation about the 25th Amendment, but what he did have conversations about were a, a cabinet meeting. He was he was convinced that there was this idea that they should convene a cabinet meeting uh, as after a way, January after 6th, January right. sixth as a way for Donald Trump to demonstrate that he was ready to move on, ready to concede, and ready to begin the transition of power. And basically, everybody that Eugene Scalia talked to about this idea, including Donald Trump, who he had an audience with to pitch this idea, thought it was a bad idea. Well, right. He's not somebody who wanted to hear about the error of his ways, if you will. What else? I mean. It's always so interesting to me that we've dropped this, I think, three three drops we've seen so far. Yeah. More to come because mm -hmm. there are thousands of pages of this stuff. The mm -hmm. DOJ desperately wants to see it all. We've known right. that. Um, we understand that the process has begun where they're handing information over to the Justice Department mm -hmm. for that separate but parallel investigation, right. right, by the special counsel into January 6th and how it all went down. What other names are you looking for? Like, with the next drop, who, who's who's left out there as far as the big fish that you want to well, see? Well, I think one of the names that I'm really interested in is Mark Milley, you know, uh, one of the highest ranking members of the Pentagon, somebody who uh, was very clearly unhappy with the way the former president conducted himself during that period of time, and that we know that there was an effort by Donald Trump and some of his allies to install people loyal to him within right. the Pentagon that would potentially play a role in kind of enforcing this idea of investigating election fraud. There was talk about them uh, for instance, seizing voting machines in different places. And, and you know, there's a widespread belief that that's why Cash Patel was placed at the Department of Defense during that period of time. So I think Mark Milley is going to be an interesting... Were these 745 Trump books uh, that came out over the last couple of years where <laughs> yeah, Mark Milley exactly. was quoted on enough yeah, for you? Exactly. I mean, he's, he, the guys apparently talked quite a bit. Yeah, but I think... you know, But it's how, different when he talked to Congress. Exactly. And, and I think the big thing here is, if you're talking about taking it from the stage of a congressional investigation, which is truly a political exercise and turning it into a prosecutable offense. What these transcripts may provide for us is this kind of overwhelming evidence that Donald Trump was told time and time again by people that he was loyal, that were loyal to him and uh, believed in him and supported him that he lost the election. And despite the fact that he was told that over and over again, he continued to peddle this lie about the election loss. And that's ultimately led all of his supporters to come to Washington on January 6th. There's also some illuminating new information from Georgia Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger about the threats, for example, that his wife faced on her private email mm -hmm. and phones, um, death threats, texts, to the point that she even texted the then two Georgia senators about it, who yeah. never apparently responded. And, and that just shows just that this, all this action by Donald Trump, this wasn't just a, you know, for fun, a sideshow. They had real life consequences and they played out on January 6th. That's a great point. Ryan Nobles, thank you for uh, all that reading. I know more to come for you over the next few days. Really appreciate it. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. And speaking of Congress, how about a little bit of breaking TikTok news out of the House of Representatives where, guess what? If you work for that chamber, you are not allowed to have TikTok anymore on any of your phones. In a memo obtained by NBC News, the Office of Cybersecurity says it's because the app is, in their words, a high risk to users. So far, this does not apply to any, like, phones or iPads or whatever that the Senate issues. Keep in mind that the new big spending bill recently signed into law by the president includes a ban of TikTok on all executive branch devices, too. Number two. One of the guys who plotted to kidnap Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer has been sentenced to 16 years in prison. The federal judge went against the prosecution, which wanted life behind bars for Adam Fox. He was convicted back in August of conspiracy to kidnap and to use a weapon of mass destruction. The sentencing for the other ringleader of that plot is tomorrow. Number three, the mayor of Jackson, Mississippi, says... She we don't know when the current water crisis in that city is going to end. People there can go to four different locations around town to pick up water because right now the water coming through their pipes is not safe to drink. The mayor also said he talked to folks who are sick of apologies. He says the water system is old and crumbling. Shouldn't be like this anymore. We're going to stay on top of this story. Number two, uh, four, sorry, some good news for home buyers because home prices went down again in October. Month number four in a row of prices falling. Economists think prices will keep slipping from their peaks in the spring, partly because of those high mortgage rates now. Number five, if you're thinking about doing a dry January, those benefits could last a whole lot longer than a month. Some new studies show people who gave up alcohol for just 30 days ended up changing their drinking habits for much longer. And that means a lot of good things for your health, like maybe losing some weight, better sleep, better moods, better energy, something to consider. Let's talk about 
Other new studies in the medical front now, including kids with mental health needs, often brought to psychiatric emergency rooms for care, but the care they get is only a temporary fix. And the kids wind up back in the pediatric ER a couple months later. These are kids with mental health crises, brought to these emergency departments by caretakers who are overwhelmed or scared, all of it, written up in a new study out today in the journal JAMA Pediatrics. Researchers are really honing in on this piece where they revisit these ERs, right? So it's not the first time, but the second or third time that these kids come back, because the kids who do that are more likely to suffer from things like psychotic disorders, disruptive control disorders, neurodevelopmental issues. In a lot of cases, the kids were treated with sedatives or other drugs on their first visit. Dr. Scott Hadland is a pediatrician at Mass General and joins us now. Explain why this is such a significant study and such a big deal here. Well, this is a major study from all across the United States of children's hospitals across this country. And I apologize, by the way, because as a pediatrician, I have caught one of these viruses going around and I'm starting to lose my voice. Um, but this study was really important because it actually demonstrated the extent to which so many children come back to the emergency department after initial visit. And clearly what's going on is that they're not receiving ultimately the services that they need outside of emergency departments and families are really left with nowhere to turn. It feels like, to me, the takeaway from looking at this new research is that the pediatric mental health system is not living up to what it needs to do for kids. Am I overreading it, or is that a fair statement? That's absolutely correct. We are in a mental health crisis among children and adolescents in this country, and the U.S. Surgeon General confirmed as much in a recent report. Um, you know, for me, as a practicing pediatrician, when I go to the office and I see patients during the day, I would estimate that at least four out of every five patients that I see on a typical day um, are struggling with mental health problems. And the most common ones are depression, anxiety, and in some cases, um, concerns about suicide. And this is what's really sort of um, overwhelming our emergency departments. And again, this is happening because families really have very few other places to yeah. turn to. So they turn to the emergency department to keep their kids safe. But so what should parents do? Because that feels like the option, right? If you're a parent, if you're a caregiver who is at the end of your, like you, you just don't know what else to do and you're desperate and you want to get this child care, you think, well, this is what I have to do. There are some services out there that can help support families. And so the government, for example, um, maintains what they call a treatment locator, which is a searchable database so that families and doctors can find um, clinical programs that are near them that can provide psychiatric care for families who need it. Um, and then, you know, looking at this study, which again is actually from a pre from the pre-COVID era. It's actually from a time before COVID had actually exacerbated depression and anxiety even more um, in recent years. Um, you know, it's important that families can also to pediatricians like me um, and ask for support because we often have services available in our offices for families that don't have other places to turn. Dr. Scott Hadlin, thank you very much for that. Appreciate it. As a reminder, if you are struggling with mental health, there are resources available to you. Take a look at your screen. However you're streaming this, take a screen grab if you're on your phone, snap a pic if you're looking at it on TV. Lots of places that are there to be able to help you, including, of course, the National Domestic Violence Helpline, and the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, 1-800-273-TALK. When we come back, we'll talk about an incoming New York congressman in a catch-me-if-you-can-esque story, now acknowledging that, yes, he did not straight up tell the truth on the campaign trail. The new reaction in just the last couple of minutes from one of his fellow congressmen-elect coming up in just a sec. To a new twist and some new pushback now in the catch me if you can esque saga over a soon to be member of Congress. With Republican George Santos acknowledging today to the New York Post and others that he didn't tell the truth about himself on the campaign trail. Like that degree from Brooke College? He didn't go there. Or that career working for Goldman Sachs and Citigroup? He didn't work there, at least not directly. Or his claims of being Jewish? He is Catholic. Santos explaining all this by saying, for example, he's embarrassed that he never graduated from college, which is why he pretended he did, and that it was a poor choice of words to say he worked at those Wall Street firms, and that it was obvious he's clearly Catholic and never claimed to be Jewish, only Jew hyphen ish, Jew ish. And despite that admittedly fraudulent resume, Santos insists he is no fraud. 
I'm not a, a criminal who defrauded the entire country and made up this fictional character and ran for Congress. A lot of people overstate in their resumes or um, twist a little bit or ingrandiate themselves. I'm not saying I'm not guilty of that. Joining us now is senior national politics reporter Jonathan Allen. And, John, one of the questions had been, okay, so this happened, right? Santos obviously didn't tell the truth. He's acknowledging that he didn't tell the truth. But will there be, will it matter, right? You now have one of his fellow incoming New York members of Congress, Nick LaLota, who's just in the last couple of minutes tweeting out a statement calling for a full investigation by the House Ethics Committee once Santos is sworn in a week from today, as he fully anticipates and expects to do. How realistic is it that there's going to be some ethics investigation into this guy? It's a great question, Holly. Holly, first I would say um, chutzpah is not a disqualifier for being a member of Congress. Uh, as far as an ethics investigation, that's probably the most likely punishment you're going to see. Uh, there was a Supreme Court case in 1969, Powell versus McCormick, involving Adam Clayton Powell from New York, where uh, basically the court said that they couldn't uh, not seat a member based on uh, stuff that had happened in between elections. Uh, there's a possibility of expulsion, but that would take two-thirds of the members of the House to do that. That's not going to happen. The Ethics Committee is the most likely venue for any sort of uh, reprimand of George Santos. Do voters care? Because Santos says he's still he's still going to go to Congress. He's still going to be there to work for the people who elected him to this position under the auspices of the resume that we previously described that now turns out um, is, is highly inaccurate. I want to play for you what he had to say on that piece of it. I will gain everybody's trust back by just delivering results for them and making sure they do not forget why they voted for me in the first place. I will be an effective member of Congress. I will be a, a diligent member of Congress, and I will be able to deliver results for Congress for the people of New York's third district. Well, look, if he's able to deliver results for the people of New York's third district to the point that they forgive all of the lies, then I guess he will uh, get away be with Be reelected in two years. Right, right. be reelected in two years. But this is not an easy district. This is a Biden district, one that Biden won by uh, about eight points. Uh, it didn't exist at the time in the, in the current configuration, but had it been run in the current configuration, Biden would have won by about eight points. So uh, he's got a lot of uphill work to do, and he's got his neighbor, who's also in a competitive district, now calling for an ethics investigation, right. Nicola. A lot of a fellow Republican incoming freshman. So he's got a lot of work to do. Um, I've never seen anything like this, Hallie. And yet at some level, it was somewhat, un it was, I think, a little bit predictable or inevitable that we were somebody going to no, get somebody. No, don't was a, do that. Don't do the savvy fraud. insider thing. This was a predict. How is this predictable? Well, I just mean that we've been moving in this direction where, you know, you asked, does it matter? And, and you have to look at what's going on in politics right now and say, like, does anything matter? Because mm. this guy lied about everything. I mean, he said he was embarrassed about not graduating from college. I'm embarrassed about my transcript. It doesn't mean that I tell people I went to Harvard, right? I mean, this is just a completely different level. And of about a bunch of other stuff, too, whether he owned properties, he didn't, whether, I mean, there's the list. Go, we only named a few of these examples here. He said, he, We could he take was, the whole hour. Right, right. Um, you know, you, you talk about, though, does anything matter, right? Like, at least in some ways, there there is pushback from inside the GOP. Like, setting inside some of the inside Weezy Washington stuff, we talked about the him being Catholic, but having talked about his grandfather who escaped Nazis in the Holocaust, like the Republican Jewish coalition is out today saying he misrepresented himself, basically saying, George Santos, please never come to any of our events ever again. Yeah, I mean, the RJC is saying, don't appropriate the Holocaust. I'm Jewish. My father's Jewish. My mother's Christian. That counts. Not making up some past history as you uh, are campaigning, right, because you think that it may be helpful to you. So it's not surprising the RJC said that. Um, I think you are going to continue to see some pushback. You probably won't see it from Kevin McCarthy uh, because he can't afford to alienate anybody who's voting for speaker between now and January And didn't Santos come out right after all this broke and said, hey, I'm going to vote for Kevin McCarthy for speaker. <laughs> uh, right. And so that's if you're Kevin yeah. McCarthy, you got to be careful not to lose any votes. Uh, George Santos again explaining all of this, saying, uh, having some reasons why he rationale, why he said these things up to the voters to decide how they see it. Jonathan Allen, thank you very much. Appreciate it. To tonight's original now with in-depth reporting on a topic we've been keeping an eye on. And tonight, it's about South Korea, which stands out among other developed democracies when it comes to, frankly, no LGBTQ plus rights, or at least very few of them. A poll from just last year says only 38 percent of South Koreans support same sex marriage. A poll from the same year here in the U.S. puts support for that in this country at 70 percent. Well, now some South Korean activists are calling on their government to take a key first step toward legal equality for the LGBTQ plus community. Megan Fitzgerald has this story. 
Jun Green is a trans male bartender in Seoul, South Korea. People will just, just see my chest and think, is that female or male? And I just wish they could just see me as just me. He says in recent years, he suffered from body and gender dysmorphia, but performing in drag has helped. I did drag. And then I started to accept my femininity, and it really helps. South Korean national law doesn't protect against discrimination based on sexual orientation or gender identity. Same-sex marriage and civil unions are illegal. And in the military, same-sex intercourse is a crime punishable by up to two years in prison. Among the world's wealthiest democracies, South Korea is one of three to receive an F, which the F and M Global Barometer of Gay Rights defines as, quote, persecuting its LGBTQ plus community. Activists say one major reform could change that. A non-discrimination bill is a basic law that would protect all citizens of South Korea from unjust discrimination without exception. Representative Jung Hae Young, a member of South Korea's National Assembly, calls herself an advocate for South Korea's LGBTQ community. For example, in South Korea, there are a few non-discrimination laws in place for the disabled or sexism in employment. However, there is no anti-discrimination law that protects all citizens. The Assembly unsuccessfully trying to pass a comprehensive non-discrimination bill at least eight times since 2008. The country's conservative president, Yoon suk Yul, his conservative People Power Party, and the powerful Christian lobbies all oppose the bill. Earlier this year, the Biden administration tapping Philip Goldberg, who is gay, to serve as U.S. ambassador to South Korea. <laughs> sparking protests from Christian groups calling the move, quote, homosexual imperialism. The offices of South Korean President Yoon suk Yul, the conservative party, and left-leaning major opposition party did not respond to our request for comment. Protestant pastor Yona Lee, a prominent voice speaking out against the bill, arguing LGBTQ plus Koreans can live their lives freely, even if they can't get married members of the community feeling differently. Because we still don't have anti-discrimination law, I often feel threatened to just walk on the street. June is putting his hope in the next generation. I think our generation and the future generation are the ones who's going to make the change. In February, then-presidential candidate Yoon said to Human Rights Watch he acknowledges the right to choose one's sexual orientation but needs to carefully approach the issue because denying biologically assigned genders and recognizing same-sex couples could have significant social impacts. To be clear, he didn't elaborate or explain what he means by impact. And, you know, opposition aside, Representative Jang says that she and her party will continue to fight for this non-discrimination bill until it becomes law. Hallie? Our thanks to Megan Fitzgerald for that story and to producer Michael Mitsanas, who worked for months to bring that story to life. Appreciate it. Coming up here on the show, the Miami Dolphins quarterback making headlines again, but not for reasons he may want. We'll talk about this concussion protocol situation and why it's prompting warnings from a few former players. Plus, one Florida couple getting the ultimate Christmas gift this year. You know what it is? We'll tell you in the local right after the break. NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day, and because you couldn't possibly read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. From our Southern Bureau, a Florida couple reunited with a lost engagement ring after something like two decades. So why are you looking at a toilet? Well, because that's but the woman accidentally flushed her diamond ring down 21 years ago, right after her husband proposed. But an eagle-eyed plumber was just replacing the toilet right before Christmas. Found it, she got it back on Christmas Day, clean and fresh. Out of our Northeast Bureau, New York City is getting ready for New Year's Eve. Workers starting to assemble the 12-foot wide ball drop situation in Times Square today. 2,600 Waterford Crystal Triangles, you can watch it drop. Of course, on NBC, in just a few days. And from our West Coast Bureau, Arizona Cardinals defensive end J.J. Watt announcing today this is going to be his last season in the NFL. 
five-time Pro Bowler posting a picture with his baby boy saying this is going to be his last home game ever. Watt is considered to be one of the best D-linemen in history, winning Defensive Player of the Year three times, leading the lead in sacks in two seasons. The announcement comes just a few months after Watt had a procedure for a heart condition. Some more news out of the NFL tonight. The QB of the Miami Dolphins back in the spotlight because of a potential head injury. Tua Togovaloa has been placed in the NFL's concussion protocol for the second time this season. It seemed like he hit his head on the ground during the second quarter on Sunday's game against the Packers. But then he played the whole game. And you might be thinking, well, wait a second. This story sounds familiar for Tua. Yeah, that's because he was knocked unconscious on the field just a few months ago. NBC News medical contributor Dr. Natalie Azar is joining us now. The, the whole Tua concussion thing back in September was pretty big news because the NFL agreed that they would update its concussion protocol. So what is actually different mm -hmm. now? Does it go far enough? Right. So, Holly, basically what happens is if a player sustains a hit and they're having symptoms, the protocol is initiated. If the player, even if the player is not having symptoms, though, and somebody on the sidelines, a coach, a player, the team doctor says, you know what, that was a pretty bad hit. We're going to initiate the protocol. They get a sideline survey. And if they have any number of symptoms like loss of consciousness, confusion, amnesia, a seizure, prior to this change, that would have meant stop play you're done. What they added was this symptom called ataxia. And that were, what that refers to, Hallie, is um, an issue with balance or your stability or your mm. motor coordination or a speech issue. And that was the difference. And by the way, if anything there is kind of equivocal, then you get taken into the locker room and you get an even you know, more thorough evaluation with experts and a neurological, uh, full neurological exam. And then they decide whether or not you can go back in. So that symptom or that sign ataxia was the thing that made a difference. You've got some former players now, some former NFLers that are saying to the Dolphins, to the NFL, even to Tua personally, basically like let your season be over now so that you don't get hurt more. We saw yeah. this from the former quarterback here in Washington, RG3, tweeting that Tua's long-term health is more important than playing again this year. Explain those long-term implications right. here, right? Absolutely. So, you know, look, I mean, most most people will say that if you have a sustain a mild concussion, which is, by the way, a traumatic brain injury that, you know, that you should fully recover within a couple of weeks or even a couple of months. Football, uh, you know, repetitive trauma in, in football or any sort of contact sport isn't really considered mild, right? And the issue here is about the cumulative effect of those insults. You know, there's a ton of research out there about, you know, how many blows to the head, all of that kind of stuff. It's not really, you can't really predict who's going to have long-term consequences like potentially C C CBT, right? right. Um, or chronic, uh, I'm, I can't even think, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, sorry, CTE. CTE, yeah. Um, you can't really predict who that's going to happen to. Um, but the issue is, of course, that with the amount of force to, uh, that the head trauma is, how many concussions you've had in the past, and then a whole host of other medical issues that, again, you can't necessarily account for. I don't blame these guys. They're saying, listen, you're done. Why would you even risk it to go in and get another injury? You really could be setting yourself up for a lifetime of issues, Hallie. Dr. Natalie Azar, thank you. We'll see what Tua does. Really appreciate you breaking that down for us. Still to come here on the show, the holiday shopping season is ramping up two days after Christmas, at least for people shopping for a Mega Millions ticket. We'll talk about what to know ahead of tonight's historic drawing and why there's so many historic drawings these days. Somebody among us may be about to give their two weeks and move to a private island. That is because the Mega Millions jackpot drawing is just hours away. Half a billion dollars at stake, man. One of the biggest potential drawings since Mega Millions started 20 plus years ago. NBC's senior national lottery correspondent, Mega Millions correspondent, Carrie Sanders, is joining us now. <laughs> Carrie, I don't, so first of all, I have seen you buy about 45 Mega Millions tickets today alone. Like, how many <laughs> tickets do you have right now in your pocket? Just tell me. 
I've lost count, but I do have one here to demonstrate. I'm going to cover my numbers because these are the numbers that are going win? to win. Unlikely. Right. There we go. Uh, mega millions. But you know what? If you were to win, it's $565 million. So that's more than a half a billion dollars. And you could probably buy, look, the boat behind me is so big, we can't even get it into the frame. <laughs> that's the kind of thing you could spend your money on if you were to win. And yeah, this is a... Uh, this is a big one. This is, well, when you consider what's been going on this year, this is yet one more giant, giant uh, kind of jackpot here. And uh, this is, believe it or not, the sixth largest in history for Mega Millions. So we're talking about some serious cash. But how can it be that we keep saying, Carrie, it feels like this year we've done a lot. Like, listen, we don't put run-of-the-mill lottos on the news like all the time, right? We do them when they're really big or history-making. And it feels like we've had a lot of them this year. Why? <clears throat> Uh, we have because the people realize who run the lotteries, if they can get sort of the odds being a little more difficult, that then fewer people seem to win and the jackpots get larger. So if there were only two numbers, it would be a 50-50 shot that you're going to win. Well, you keep adding numbers, the combinations of permutations of all of that result in not a lot of winners. And when you don't have a lot of winners, the jackpots grow and grow and grow. Yeah. Uh, it was just last month that there was another 502, I think it was, let's say $502 million wow. Mega Millions ticket. It was one was sold in California, the other one here in Florida. So, yeah, when you get that big money, everybody's eyes just sort of pop and get excited. Whatever happened with that like billion dollar jackpot, the biggest, the, the monster of them all, the monster mama? Did anybody ever claim like, that? You're wrong. It that? wasn't a billion. It was two billion. It was two point oh, my four, bad. two point oh four billion. <laughs> Look, it's just so many. No, if a billion the, after taxes. Carrie, I was just doing the math. Space here. Ah, okay. Well, there we go. Um, your uh, CPA would say you still have way too much money to ever figure out what you would do with that. Uh, that money, as far as we know, the person has not been announced. We don't know who that winner is, but the name will come forward at some point because that winner was a single winner in California. And if this is the single winner, Hallie, just or maybe a winner, and you don't see me here next year, maybe you can draw some conclusions. Oh, I'll be... I'll be looking for a little gifty in the mail if that's the case, Mr. Kerry Sanders. You have my address. Thank you. Um, hey, I appreciate you. Listen, good luck. We'll see how the drawing goes tonight, Kerry. Uh, glad you're on. Again, our senior lottery luck, jackpot correspondent. Good luck. That does it for us for this hour. We're going to have more of you here tomorrow. Same time, same place. Hope you get out to get your ticket. More coverage picks up <laughs> right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.